Good morning subscribers. So just wanting to tackle with you the next in the series on um, the 100 year life which is chapter 3 which is all to do with working. No doubt you'll be familiar with this book that we've been looking at. I'm actually going to uh, break this down into just two little sections because chapter 3 working is quite a large chapter and there's quite a lot in this so I'm going to break it down. This is chapter 3 part 1 to be followed obviously by chapter 3 part 2. So in chapter 3 part 1 so called um, the authors start off by saying just think of what's happened in the last 100 years. If you were a centenarian and you were 100 years of age today just think of all the different things that you would have witnessed and experienced in the last 100 years. World wars, the internet, electric vehicles, etc, etc. The list is endless and there is a whole list presented uh, in the second page of chapter 3, which I'll not go into. If you buy the book, you'll be able to read it for yourselves. But you can see that if you're 100 years old today, you'll have experienced so many changes and seen so many advances um, and so many terrible things uh, as well during your lifetime. And so therefore, to look into the future to the next 100 years is pretty pretty uh, difficult to predict what's likely to happen. So if we take, for example, the United States 100 years ago, what sector predominated and dominated in the United States? Well, it was agriculture. Fast forward 100 years, what sector now dominates? Well, it's very much like our own. It's the service sector. Looking to the future, what areas are likely to dominate? And therefore, this is an area perhaps where you might consider tailoring your university study. So maybe in the next 100 years it's going to be obviously technology, robotics, AI, artificial intelligence. But of course we must also temper that with the fact that we do have an aging population and the demographic is going to be getting older and so we must bear in mind that yes people are going to be working longer in these different sectors However, they are going to be older and we must take that into consideration when we consider how the economy is going to react and drive forward. There's going to be a lot of um, issues to do with migration as well. Now if you think about productivity and what happens in certain sectors as a consequence of productivity, if you think for example, um, if we take the agricultural sector, Agriculture over the last hundred years has come, become much more productive. Now, in terms of demand and supply, we could of course illustrate this. Supply and demand. If uh, fertilizers and so on and so forth make agricultural markets more productive, that means that the supply increases. Therefore, the prices that they are able to charge in the agricultural sector, they also then fall. Now, as a consequence of that, the rewards for being in the agricultural sector, they then fall as well. And so people think to themselves, well, what's the point of getting into this agricultural, um, generally dri driven now by technology and automation? And so you get this movement and this migration away from agricultural markets into other sectors and hence that's the reason why we've seen this move away from agriculture and into other service sector based uh, sectors such as leisure. Now if you think about the leisure industry, say yoga, right? yoga is right up my street. If you're a yoga teacher it's very difficult really to become a lot more productive as a yoga teacher and so as a consequence you don't get this uh, very substantial and significant increase in supply therefore the reward for being a yoga teacher does not decline, decline, decline all the time and hence you get this movement and this migration from the sector in which the rewards to the labour are declining towards uh, the sectors where the rewards to the labour are not declining or certainly not declining as fast and so productivity, you'll know that in the UK we do have a bit of an issue with productivity, it's an inherent weakness in the UK economy, but productivity is a key factor which will uh, determine how uh, labour migrates from one sector to the other. Now if we look to the next 100 years, if we've got more people who are 100 years of age or more, then perhaps 
there's going to be a shift of um, resource into the healthcare sector. Or perhaps, who knows what will happen, but with climate change and so on, perhaps sustainable energy is going to become much more predominant in the economy of the future. And so as a consequence of that, we'll get a movement into the sustainable energy industry. So this whole notion of productivity and migration of labour is very important. The other thing in this early part of chapter 3, which is also very important, is that the economy will become much more dynamic. And the book quotes a few stats about the number of companies which are registered on the FTSE, the Financial Times Stock Exchange Index, and the way in which um, they have either moved into the FTSE or moved out of the FTSE. Now that in the last uh, few decades has been fairly static and you tend to see the same companies dominating the FTSE year after year after year after year. Well in the future with a much more dynamic economy, dynamic changing all the time, we'll see more companies moving into the FTSE and out of the FTSE on a more frequent basis. Um, and so that will obviously also be a sign of a more dynamic economy and an economy in which um, certain sectors they dominate for a while and then they move out and then new sectors move in. And then the other thing to consider is the way in which people will work in the future. And we see it already today. Technology means that more people are able to work from home. So we get more home working. Now home working really is a good thing, especially if you think about congestion and pollution and so on and so forth. One great way to reduce all of that is to say to people, you don't need to travel into the office. And indeed this whole notion of working in an office or in an office block is probably going to be redundant in the next uh, 100 years. Work from home instead. We'll see, the, and we're seeing it already, the rise of the gig economy. People fitting their work around their working lives. And we, we've talked about this already, this whole notion of the three-stage life cycle, education, employment, retirement, that's not going to be the economy of the future. The economy of the future is going to be much more dynamic than that. And so you'll work for a bit, then maybe you'll stop working because you'll have family, and then you'll move back into the workplace. Now the whole rise of the gig economy so people working for Uber, people working for Deliveroo, all of these types of things, the gig economy makes this much more possible. And then finally, we will see more and more migration to the cities. Now migration to the cities is obviously happening, particularly if you look at the Chinese economy, the rural area becomes neglected as people move uh, into the cities, where, which is the, the, the hub where all of the big companies are, but around all these big companies we'll probably in the future see much more uh, clusters of very small but very innovative small to medium sized enterprises rising up and supporting uh, a few very large companies. And the, it's the small companies which are more agile uh, of foot and therefore more able to um, adjust quickly to the changing dynamics of a very dynamic economy. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to leave it at that. That's chapter 3, part 1, and then tomorrow I'll bring you chapter 3, part 2.